You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. Good. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. I thought it was a great start. Welcome to Who Art Ed? Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. For this episode, which is releasing on President's Day in the United States, it seems only fitting to be talking about Jean-Antoine Houdin and his statue of George Washington. Now, before I get started, I do want to remind everybody I am gearing up for this year's annual Arts Madness Tournament once again. Um, Every year, it is so cool to see this little thing I started in my classroom get bigger and bigger as people all across the U.S. and even in other countries vote for their favorite artists in a series of head-to-head matchups. This year's tournament, actually 60 of the artists and artworks are from the AP Art History list for high school students across the U.S. who are studying for those AP Art History tests, trying to get a little bit of college credit this spring. If you want to learn more, see the brackets, uh, make a prediction about which artist you think will win, you can go to whoartedpodcast.com. And remember, voting starts Monday, February 26th. Now, on to the actual topic for today's episode, Jean-Antoine Houdin and his statue of George Washington. After the successful Revolutionary War, many state governments began to commission public art to commemorate the event. And public art can serve many functions, but it's rarely mere decoration. Monuments are erected to celebrate and display our ideals. The Virginia Assembly wanted a statue of George Washington for obvious reasons, as he was a Virginian who had led the Continental Army to victory, and he was the first president of the United States. Well, technically he was the first president elected under the Constitution of the United States. If you go back to the Articles of Confederation, which also called for a president— though the office looked kind of different, John Hansen was the first president of the United States in Congress assembled under the Articles of Confederation, which was the predecessor to the United States Constitution. Anyways, in 1784, so still in the Articles of Confederation days, before Washington would become president, the governor of Virginia asked Thomas Jefferson to find an artist to sculpt a statue of George Washington. With America having just recently won its independence as a nation, the statue of Washington would be an important symbol. Jefferson had very strong ideas about art and design as a means of inspiring people to reach new heights. A marble statue in the neoclassical style would fit perfectly in the state capitol building Jefferson designed. Classical elements like columns and marble statues referenced ancient Greece and Rome as a signal that while the nation may be new, it's rooted in ideas and traditions going back thousands of years. It's sort of sending that signal that it's timeless and enduring. Creating a statue that would be both aesthetically pleasing and filled with the grand symbolism required of the moment would be no small feat. Enter Jean-Antoine Houdin. He was the most famous and accomplished neoclassical sculptor of the day. Now, neo means new and classical means, well, the opposite. It was a reaction against the frivolous Rococo movement that had come before. It was in some ways backward-looking, as it was inspired by ancient Greek and Roman works, but the Neo in Neoclassicism was also a reflection of the new ideas of the Enlightenment through the 18th century. Enlightenment thinkers focused on science and reason. The movement was heavily influenced by humanism, which sprang up in the Renaissance, and like Renaissance artists and intellectuals, they read a lot of classical literature. Neoclassical artists sought to express ideas that would stand the test of time. They wanted viewers to learn and grow by perceiving moral messages from the symbolism within the work. Jean-Antoine Houdin was one of the greatest neoclassical sculptors of the late 18th century. So here's a bit about him before we get into the art. 
Houdan was born March 20th, 1741, in the opulent surroundings of Versailles, France, though he was not part of the aristocracy. His father was a servant. Houdan's father encouraged his son to develop his talents. By the age of nine, Houdan was showing exceptional abilities as a sculptor, and at 11, he entered the Royal Academy for formal training. In 1761, at the age of just 20, Houdin's talent was undeniable as he won the coveted Prix de Rome, which awarded him a stay in Italy where he was able to study quite a bit of classic sculptures and ancient Roman art. His work aligned with the Enlightenment ideals, valuing reason, observation, naturalism, and he made busts of prominent philosophers. He sculpted notable figures across Europe and America, including Voltaire, Franklin, Napoleon Bonaparte, and George Washington, as we'll get to. He captured not only what these historical figures looked like, but he tried to show a bit of their personality and convey ideas through the sculpture. To do this, he would observe his subjects in action, Houdin spent two weeks following Washington around, studying his movements, his posture. He was meticulous in his craftsmanship, striving to capture every detail. Houdin frequently made life masks of his subjects. Uh, Those were plaster casts of a subject's face, capturing not only the large features like the eyes, nose, and mouth. His plaster casts would bring out every subtle texture, the wrinkles in the skin, the droop under the jaw. Initially, Houdin was supposed to make his sculpture of Washington just based on sketches by Charles Wilson Peale because Jean-Antoine Houdin was based out of France, but, you know, Washington, obviously, was in Mount Vernon here in the U.S. It seemed difficult to make a good 3D representation of a figure based on a 2D drawing, so Houdin traveled thousands of miles and came to the U.S. in 1785. Houdin and two of his assistants got to work taking precise measurements, making a mold of Washington's face and all of that, The first draft was actually classical, somewhat idealized, but apparently George Washington was not a fan. Washington insisted on being depicted in more current, fashionable clothing. Now, this, I think, was an interesting choice. The medium of white marble and the pose are quite classical, but Washington insisted that he not be in like a toga going full on classical and looking like an ancient Greek or Roman god. He wanted to be in his uniform. Now, this choice grounds the statue. I mean, it's not some mythic hero, but a real man and a product of his time. While Washington stands in his military uniform, he holds a gentleman's walking stick in his right hand. His sword is off to the side. Houdin wanted to show the complex, layered nature of Washington as a powerful head of the American military who did something few have the strength for. Not only did he lead the American army to victory over the British— He also willingly stepped down and relinquished power to go back to being a private citizen on his farm. Houdin was no doubt drawing a parallel between Washington and the ancient Roman story of Cincinnatus, who wielded enormous power. Basically, he was given the power of a dictator during a trying time, and then he gave up that power after a military victory. This duality of citizen-soldier, the strong leader, remaining humble, really the whole notion of the peaceful transition of power, it's like literally etched into stone right from the earliest days of America. Now, after his time in the U.S., you know, studying Washington, Houdin returned to Paris and began work on the full-size rendering in marble. He dated the statue 1788, but... I guess that might have been a little bit ambitious. It looks like he didn't finish until about four years later. I like to imagine he was one of those artists thinking, okay, if I set a deadline and etch it into stone, I'll have to get my act together and focus to finish this thing. 
and it was finally delivered in 1796 to coincide with the completion of the Virginia State Capitol Rotunda. The portrait is beautiful. It's highly accurate in capturing not only his likeness, but Washington's attitude. There's this aura of like a wise, stately, almost fatherly figure. Washington stands in the classic contraposto stance, which is the ancient Greek pose of a figure essentially putting weight on one leg as the engaged leg and the the other bent slightly at the knee. We've seen this pose in sculptures dating back thousands of years to the ancient Greek Polycletus and his famous canon. It conveys a sense of movement within the figure. With a marble statue, weight can also be an issue, and Houdon incorporated objects to both physically support the marble and carry symbolic weight. Washington's left arm rests atop the phrasis, which was a Roman symbol of authority. But in this statue, the phrasis is a bundle of 13 rods, obviously referencing the 13 original states. In a statue so loaded with symbolism, I think there's something kind of beautiful about the fact that George Washington, you know, one of our great founding fathers, is resting his arm upon and putting weight upon that bundle of rods signifying those 13 original states bound together as a symbol of their strength through their unity, which goes right in line with the national motto, E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.